tables. Unbelievably productive discussions. You know, I, I've expected something like this, of course, with the caliber and quality of people we have here, but unbelievably good insights. You know, people share experiences, people brainstorm, um, people come up with new ideas, wonderful. So at this point, I would like our panel members to take their seats right there, next to their names, hopefully. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pass the microphone on to uh, Marilyn, who's going to start up, um, start us off uh, from the debrief. We're going to debrief each table. Uh, each table lead will, you know, uh, talk about their conversations and outcomes, and then she will. Uh, she'll probably let panel, uh, panel members uh, reflect on those uh, thoughts that you had, that each table had. And then we'll go uh, from this to perhaps some questions and to the main panel discussion. Okay, does that sound okay with you? Is it okay with you? So here's Marilyn. Thank you. Well, let's start with uh, table one. I don't know who was assigned to speak for table one. So. I'm afraid I was. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marilyn. So um, uh, let me just introduce my, my uh, table team uh, members. We had Doreen Hackey, we had Maria Godinez, Kim Howell, Richard Watanabe, and Gregory Scott uh, in the group. It was an incredibly rich discussion, so please forgive me if I uh, misrepresent any of the uh, of the views and if I forget anything. So I think starting out, I would say that uh, somehow the, the premise when we talk about talent management is that uh, it's inferior to anything else that's going on in, 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 uh, in a corporation and executives don't get it. Um, and we sort of dispelled that, uh, that myth a little bit. Uh, uh, Doreen pointed out that uh, only about 14% of employees know, actually know the business strategy of their own organization. So it's not just uh, the talent management is not getting the awareness in corporations that it should have, it's generally the business strategy that doesn't have a lot of awareness. And by the way, I forgot the topic of uh, table one was <laughs> talking about the interface between organizational talent strategy and business strategy. So that's why you hear me talking about business strategy a bit. And then we also said that uh, the C-suite executives are not always the bad guys. Uh, we feel that they actually get it. They get the value and the importance of talent and managing the talent pipeline. Uh, but uh, communicating that to other areas in the organization, to lower layers in the hierarchy, that is uh, the real challenge. Um, we also said that uh, business strategy and talent strategy aren't necessarily opposites. In fact, talent strategy should be integrated in the corporate strategy. Uh, it should be a functional strategy, just like any other functional strategy would be part of the business strategy. Um, we mentioned that often, you know, why, why do we not focus more on talent management? It's often because the urgent and immediate takes precedent over the important and, and long term. Um, and talent management is often thought of as something that is more long-term uh, and not quite as pressing. So what we need is we need systems and processes that not only facilitate but that require that people engage in, uh, uh, in, in activities that are directly related to talent management measured by KPIs uh, and integrated in performance management. Uh, systems and by building those systems eventually those systems will gel solidify and become a part of the culture of an organization um, we also had questions around structure and hierarchy uh, are structure and hierarchy counterproductive when it comes to to talent management uh, we are in, in, uh, implying in a way that talent management is something that's more grassroots and it's it's uh, bottom-up and not necessarily top-down based on the idea that you find gems among your employees anywhere in all layers of the organization. So a question is, how do we harness that? 
as an organization? How do we make sure that the best ideas bubble up and uh, uh, just like the Cheesecake Factory does it, the, the best people get uh, uh, rewarded and, and highlighted? Um, we also said that strategies change. Um, so if you have something that's really temporary and, and fleeting, then the one thing that becomes important are the values. We've heard Dina say that uh, somebody is so cheesecake, and uh, Kim told us that uh, when she worked at Google, the term was somebody is so googly, or you're, you're not googly at all by doing something. Um, and, and that, that uh, those, uh, those values, again, help us probably to bridge uh, business strategy and talent strategy. So I think uh, the main outcome is uh, talent management and business strategy are not opposites. Uh, we just need to make sure the talent strategy becomes a part of business strategy. Do any of the panelists want to feel free to comment after we finish each table or we can wait till the end when I... Okay. <laughs> So I guess we'll begin with table number two, being a member of an organization. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll use it. Oh. oh. Okay. Um, our topic was being a member of an organization. And we had Amy, Chris, Amon. Huh? what he said. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can butcher a name better than anybody. Um, we had uh, Jody and, uh, I am so sorry, Ashley and Brick, who facilitated the conversation. Um, we talked quite at length about being a member of an organization, and we decided that, that the um, the first step is to decide why you're going into that organization, prompting you to be a part of a particular organization, whether it be a softball team, um, a company, um, a nonprofit, whatever, whatever you're drawn to, whatever you want your career to be in, what, what is drawing you to that particular um, organization? And I think that it's important that each of us understands why we're drawn to a particular place, whether it's altruistic or it's, um, I like the product, I love cheesecake, um, whatever your, your, your go-to is, um, that's, that's why you're going to, to a particular organization. So um, being part of the team, I think, when uh, it's like with onboarding, um, one of the first things that we have to do is to make sure that the person um, feels valued. And we've, uh, I think Vlad talked about that this morning, um, feeling valued and being engaged. And um, Amy s said that one of her, her happy place, you think happy place, okay, so everybody goes right to the big D, right? And Amy said that her happy place was Trader Joe's. It's like, Trader Joe's, really? Okay, well, but her explanation was that the people there are friendly. They're happy people. They always are so helpful, and they're really team-oriented, and her son finds dates there. <laughs> That might have been a stretch, but um, but it's a happy work environment, and, and that's why she likes to go there. So it's really important for, for us as employers or HR folks to give um, the, the new employee their expectations, what we expect out of them. What, what do we want from them? But it's also important for, for that new person to tell us what their expectations are. So um, we want to uh, also um, help people understand that they, as a new employee, they're going to have an effect on uh, the organization and how they can make a difference in the lives of others. They're going to be involved in 
um, working with other people, their coworkers or their patients or, or whomever their audience is, and how they're going to make a difference in, in the lives of their, the people that they come in contact with. Um, also, we determined that a superstar is not necessarily made for management or leadership. Just because a person is really good at what they do doesn't mean that they're going to be that promotable person who is going to be a fabulous leader and, and be able to take their team to greater heights. Uh, we, we determined that the, the superstar doesn't always have those uh, leadership traits. Can you build them into a leader? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some people are not... They are to be the, the, the followers and the, the, uh, the doer people, I guess, the, the people who do the work and not those leaders. Um, it's important to support those people. In the um, position that I was in, I had a director who was promoting superstars. They weren't leaders. And so in order to help them come along, I wanted to make sure that we helped them be as successful as they could be. And so we, we uh, devised a supervisory training program that, and I really, Brick, I like that leader instead of supervisor. Um, one of the things that Brick brought up was that you call, he calls the supervisors leaders rather than, rather than uh, supervisors, and I like that. Um, I like that a lot. That was kind of, I guess that was my aha. So thank you for that. Um, but anyway, so we, so we came up with a, a supervisory training program and, and helped bring those folks who were great at their jobs become better leaders. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's important that each one of us knows our purpose. I think I said that. but. Um, we want to make sure, and to coin Amy's phrase, give them a warm welcome and a fond farewell. I like that too. Um, but we have to treat all of our, our uh, employees with a lot of respect and dignity. They just can't walk in, you tell them what the job is, and they go do their jobs and never to be heard from you again. Uh, we have to support them, we have to back them up, and we have to treat them um, better than we would ourselves, I guess. So we want to make sure that we, whenever a new employee comes in, we want to make sure that they understand the mission and the values and the ethics and the culture of our organization. We want them to know what their job expectation is. We want to know how their job fits into the whole scheme of the organization. We used uh, a P&L as uh, an example. Um, where are you in this? Well, I was always told as HR that I was the spender, I wasn't the earner. So I was, I was the, um, the liability rather than the asset. That really makes you feel good, doesn't it? <laughs> HR, I'm, an, I'm an, a liability, okay. Um, and then finally, um, the immediate value to a new, and I'm quoting Brick, the immediate value of a new employee is that they are different. And they are objective, and they are going to have a new perspective on what, what you're doing in your offices and in your, in your work areas. So we need to really listen to them. We need to, to give them credit where credit is due. And um, all the touchy-feely kinds of things, I think that's really important now. I talked about a, a situation where um, my former supervisor, he wasn't a leader, um, wanted me to be intimidating. And it was like, that was really uncomfortable for me, but I kind of got into it. And then when he was fired, <laughs> 
um, <laughs> then my new executive director said, you've got to calm down. You've got to, <laughs> you know, you've got to chill and, and be nice to people because you're just a real witch with a B. And, and so it, I had to work a couple of years, truth be known, it was probably longer than that, um, to really calm myself down and to be more personable with our employees and to, to respect who they were. And, and I thought that I had finally achieved that when I terminated someone and they said, oh, Patty, thank you so much. So I, I think my, my whole presentation with the, with the staff was, was totally different. Um, and, and really plays into the touchy-feely, um, you've got to listen to them and, and teach them with, or treat them with respect and dignity. So, thank you. So, table three. Hi, table three, Primo Custodio. This is uh, my team here, Hillary, Darren, Karen Roche Rochelle, right? Karen, Rochelle, have those back, and Andrea. Um, a lot of experience at our table. Sorry? And thank you, Bob. How could I do that? See, I, I should be standing over here. Um, our issue was organizational culture and times of change, and we had a really uh, diverse team in terms of experience with changes in organizational culture, everything from in the public sector to private sector to um, large corporations and individuals. Um, who are entrepreneurs here. So we talked about some of the factors that affect organizational cultures, and I think we're all in agreement that changing business strategies can absolutely affect organizational culture. If you're looking at a different market, if you're uh, taking a different approach uh, to changes in uh, consumer demands, that'll change your culture. We talked about technology, which we all know uh, pushes that button for, cult, for um, organizations every day. Um, we talk demographics. And then when we really looked at these issues of um, organizational culture, I think the first thing we thought in response to this issue is, do you understand your company's culture? That is first and foremost. Because you're really not going to have a grasp of what is happening around you unless you understand the culture. And if you understand the culture, the thinking is, is that you'll have a better idea of what the impact is on those external factors I cited that are going to put pressure on your culture or actually change your, your culture. You have to understand also where that culture is most vulnerable. If it's in the area of talent management, for example, and your company has an excellent, what you think is an excellent talent management program in place, and then a very large corporation comes in with a very different uh, mindset about talent management, you're going to have to sit down and think about, okay, what are we going to be able to change here or we're going to be allowed to change? What are some of the gold standards for the new company acquiring us that we're going to have to adhere to? And how do we make a blend out of that um, so we still retain the talent? We talk through employee surveys or employee engagement surveys when culture changes. And I just happened to bring up uh, Steve Burke when we put together the um, cultural, the employee engagement survey right after Comcast bought us in 2011. He said, and we said, we need to have a dimension of that survey that measures the success of this merger in terms of what our culture is. So it was interesting, we did focus groups, we had employees come in, kind of the voice of the employee, and we said, okay, here are the questions you need to be asking on this survey with the workforce. And it was very interesting because he did hold the managers and executives accountable for moving the needle, I think it was two years later, in terms of improving engagement in those areas. So the other thing uh, we discussed was, do you educate, how do you educate your managers about this issue of change, the change acceleration process? Because they're the ones that are going to be at the helm, really, and leading this change. So I need to understand, what is change? What are my employees going to go through? Quite frankly, what am I going to go through as a leader in the company? Um, 
I think once you have an understanding and a foundation, then collectively the management team should be able to move and respond accordingly. But then again, they just have to have that understanding. And I think a lot of times we don't take the time with our managers to train them on this issue of organizational change and what's driving it and how to respond to it. And I can't remember who on um, our team uh, brought up this issue of um, organizational change and how it impacts the employees. What's happening at the employee level? Um, Andrea was talking about getting employees in a room and sitting down and mapping their process, what they do, what the customer's um, expectations are. Now we have all this organizational change, but customers, like in the film industry, are, are still going to want to see movies that are real entertaining, high quality, but if you have a major uh, organizational change taking place, they need to have some context for that. So why not get them in a room, have them you know, go through the process and map it out, understand, give them a sense of identity in this time of turmoil. And then finally, we talked about communication and transparency. You have to be transparent in your communication. And this led to the number one issue I think we all talked about, and that is trust. There's nothing worse than times of organizational change because all your issues bubble up to the surface. Your infrastructure, your communication, and quite frankly, employees tolerate less during periods of change. And I think that's true for all of us as basically as a society. And that's something we want to have our finger on the pulse when it comes to talent management. So those are some of the dimensions uh, that we reviewed. And just in summary, educate your, educate your managers and the team in um, organizational change. Know your uh, organizational culture. Build trust. Be transparent. And to address the iceberg or um, Sheen's model, What's happening down there in that two-thirds under the water? Do you really understand what's there and why it's there? Did I forget anything? OK. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Primo. Right. Yep. <laughs> so we're getting such great feedback, we're running a little long. Oh, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, if we could keep the summaries down to around no, five minutes. Be, so no, that's not personal. <laughs> Is this on? Yes. This will be very quick because I want the panel to have to work some also. <laughs> we uh, ended up talking a lot about dysfunctional organizations, dysfunctional cultures, and particularly in cases where the people at the top aren't necessarily very supportive of change. They may not be opposed to it, maybe they don't want to take it on. Uh, what, what tools or what approaches or what perspectives does a manager sort of in the middle have in trying to deal with organizations where there's a lot of negativity, uh, people aren't supportive of each other necessarily, not strong commitment to organizational goals. How do you deal with that as a manager? Very succinct. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Table five. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Craig. This is Veronica. Um, we have Charles. Let's try me your name again. Shafia. Jim was also on our panel. And Carolyn? And Carolyn, so our, our discussion was how do you retain top talent? And some of the things we talked about was, oh, and I'm so sorry, Marilyn, you were with us as well. And you're already you're up there. I just thought you were sitting here. That's all right. <laughs> so, and please feel free to jump in if I forget anything. But one of the big things that um, we talked about with retainment is, you know, the work-life balance or, uh, I guess, maintaining the things you sell when, you're, uh, when someone comes on. You know, we talked about are you, are you walking the walk and talking the talk? as an organization. Um, there was, it, what I loved about our table is it was a very diverse group of different organizational cultures. We have you know, talent recruitment, we had IT, um, you, you know, right, it, was, uh, it was journalism, thank you, and then hospitality. And everyone has a different culture and you know, they had to kind of adapt retainment in different ways. You, know, you were mentioning that you've accepted the fact, you know, not only accepted but embraced um, this idea that millennials and their high turnover rate and how they're always looking to move around jobs, so you became kind of like a talent conveyor belt. And um, that's even what you tell them, the transparency aspect of it is, you know, we're here to train you to move on to the next place and to be even better. Um, and, you know, you as well recognizing top talent and then growing them and developing them. Development became one of the biggest discussions that we had was how do you develop your top talent? Um, 
And so, gosh, in the sake of time, I'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things I also noticed was acknowledging your top talent. And there's a difference between cultures. Some people love to be acknowledged, and they love others could, could not hate it more and do not want to be the center of attention, but you still want to find a way to recognize them um, and their value. Thank you, guys. That, that was a great summation of a very wide-ranging topic, so thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and table number six. My mother used to live in a nursing home, and I went to visit her one time, and I joined her at lunch, and we were sitting at a table like this, and she said, everyone else wants to sit at our table. I said, why? In other words, employer of choice. Uh, I said, why? She said, because we're the only ones who laugh. <laughs> it felt good to be there, and that's why people wanted to be at their table to be an employer of choice. And this, this comes from, from Madge and, and from Bill Guy and from Loredana and from Darlene and Mario? Miguel, thank you, and Leveda. Um, first, you've got to care. If you don't care, it's going to show on every level of the organization. So if you want to be an employer of choice, you've got to care. And then you've got to be flexible enough to make the experience of being there enjoyable for all the participants. And we talked about a lot of things you could do. Uh, there are three essentials for any relationship to thrive. This comes from the field of marriage enrichment. Mutual commitment to the success of the relationship. If one party is not, it's doomed anyway, right? And, and that always varies in intensity. Sometimes you're more committed, sometimes I'm more committed. But that's got to be managed. Second thing, open communication, the truth flows, good or bad news, constantly. And third is that there need to be clear understandings as to what you expect from each other. And one of the ways to encourage that is, is teach people the civil treatment of others in the workplace. Um, clarify what are you paid to do, not what, are you, not what behaviors, but what outcomes. Um, cultivate emotional intelligence in the organizations because people tend to run meetings like they manage their staff. So if you don't teach them how to run meetings, then it's going to show up in multiple ways. And also understand that there's 84 million millennials, 78 million baby boomers. So you've got to adapt to the millennial uh, mindset and the millennial needs and such. Otherwise, your organization won't be able to evolve as it could. Thank you. Wonderful. Before we begin uh, panel discussion, may Please collect your notes. <laughs> <laughs> or you can send them to me. Yeah, can you send them to me, maybe? You know how to reach me? Yeah. I'm, I'm right here. No, via email. <laughs> reach me via email. Um, and um, yes. So, Jim, you know my email? Gerhard, do you know my Oh. <laughs> See? Patty. I'm sure you can find my email. Um, who's, been, who's here? Primo knows my email. I just want to summarize Greg and Chuck. He l left with his notes. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you very much. And Marilyn, back to you. Thank you. So outstanding presentations. I thought that was great feedback. Lots of food for thought. So now I'm going to turn to the panelists. And as I ask the questions of you, feel free to pull in any of the thoughts that you might have following from the um, table discussions and summaries. So the first question is for Doreen. What is the relationship between talent strategy and business strategy in an organization? I addressed that in my introduction when I gave you the visual cue of uh, the cascading business objectives and how the talent management strategy is intimately involved and coordinated with that process. The horizontal ensuring that you've got the infrastructure in place. And what do I mean by infrastructure? We talk about integrated talent management strategy. So if you look at a large organization, and here's an example that I was faced with, uh, they wanted one way of developing global leaders with various regions. But within those regions, the succession planning process was not consistent. There was a six box, a nine box, a 12 box, and a 21 box. So how do you integrate that? That's key. 
Um, but assuming that we agree that there's the cascading of business objectives and uh, understanding that the HR strategy goes across all functional areas, all divisions. So it is my job to understand what they highlight, what their objectives are in delivering that strategy, because I've got to bring it all together. Then the question is implementation of the strategy. Implementation of the strategy is not for HR's sake only. You are selling. You are in constant sell mode. You are selling to the leadership, and you are building strategies that they have to own and implement. If, that doesn't, if that's not in place, then your strategy has failed. So when you think about implementation, what are the connotations of that? Communication. What are the, the strategies for communication? So are you constantly talking with their, their teams? Are you constantly holding, holding web access so that they understand what the next phase of the implementation of the HR strategy is? How are you reporting the results, benefits, and achievements of that strategy to that senior leadership team? So that now they have the information where they continue could, can continue to promote and talk about that within the organization. So your imperative is to build advocacy. That you need to have systems, processes that management can own and implement. Otherwise, you're not doing your job as HR. We're doing HR for HR's sake, and that's not what we want to do. You don't want to fall into that, that trap. Um, so those were the additional points that I wanted to, to address. Thanks, Doreen. And I think we we'll, uh, should have some time at the end to take some questions. Um, so I'm going to move on to Jim. Um, what are the most important factors in building and maintaining a strong, cohesive culture in complex and diverse organizations? We have a hotel of 600 people. And as I said earlier, some of them are soccer moms from Simi Valley. Some of them are just left migrant workers and now are dishwashers or uh, bussers in a restaurant. So a very diverse population. Um, and we need to make them all happy. We need to engage with all of them. So we've gotten better over time. It's been an 11-year journey at Four Seasons Westlake Village. And I'm happy to report that we're having our best success this year. So I'm, I'm here at the right time. Some of the things we put into place were we noticed that if we really wanted to be the employer of choice, are our town hall meetings going to be only in English, or are we going to do two town hall meetings, one in Spanish and one in English, and have a translator for every, you know, the GM does not speak Spanish, but the HR system manager does, and she presented. So we changed that to great um, success. The employee survey just finished, and we got we went up seven points in our communication skills. Um, we have TVs on every hallway because, you know, how many touch points are there? I think she, uh, Lady from Cheesecake was talking about that. You, don't ha you have a small shift briefing, and that's it. And then you're on the floor. So we have touch points in the hallways. We have TVs that show messages in English and Spanish. We have flyers that we make to communicate every uh, message that we need to communicate. Um, but the, the most magic, I think, comes from knowing your employees and going to them instead of having them come to your company. Um, there's this week called Housekeeping Appreciation Week that happens in September all over the world. And uh, other departments say, why don't we get an appreciation week? And we say, <laughs> would you like to work in housekeeping? Nope. All right. <laughs> then they get the week. Uh, so just as one example of what we did, um, so my dad taught me to play guitar when I was a kid. And so I learned the song Volver, Volver, which some of you may know. And it's just this old ballad. And it's a love song, right? And so I went and performed for the housekeeping staff you know, in their language. And I said, hey, I wrote this song last night. It's a love song just for you guys. <laughs> Def definitely written by me. you know. And this is how much we love you. Yeah. Um, that's just an example of one thing that the HR director did. But all of the executives um, did something special for them. And that's, that's just one week of the year. We make sure that we have department managers who speak the language of the staff that they are, um, that they are managing, that they're leading. Um, if you don't speak Spanish and you want to be a housekeeping manager, you better be the best 
best communicator in the world or the best leader in the world, and maybe we'll consider that. But you've got to, to hire people, hire leaders that can connect the company culture to the culture of the people and just bridge that gap. Because communication is constant and things are changing all the time. Um, so those are some of the ways that we make sure that everybody's singing off of the same, same songbook. Um, we only hire people who fit with the culture of the company. We have a four-step interview process. Everybody meets the executive office, either the general manager or the hotel manager, number one or number two. There's a final interview to make sure that the company's culture and the employee's culture line up exactly. Um, and we sometimes get that wrong, but we have a 90-day performance uh, uh, period, a uh, probationary period. And uh, we make sure that we only pass people that really, truly do uh, fit within that culture. That allows us to do everything much, much easier because we're all alike. We, we hire people that sunshine and happiness coming out of every pore of their body. And that's important <laughs> for the uh, dishwashers that you never see as a guest, and it's important for the front desk agent, right? Because downstairs, there's a level underneath the lobby where I work, and they keep all the trolls downstairs, <laughs> let only the pretty people upstairs. Uh, the, uh, but the downstairs bubbles up to the top, right? And, and the way we treat each other downstairs definitely has an effect up there. And so it makes it really, really easy to, to, to have one culture when you're, you're all alike and you're all treating each other well. And that's exactly what you're asking the employees to do to the guests, go treat them well. Thank you very much. Uh, Brick, what does it really mean to be a member of an organization? The name tag, the ball cap, and the coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you know, I, I'm going to tie into something that Gary Hart brought up, and, about, and that's uh, um, we talked, and you did a great job with talking about the, the respect, um, the, uh, the the feeling that you're valued, and that you're making an impact, and you can contribute. Um, and there's various stages of what that means, uh, depending on your your experience level and then how long you've been with the company. But I'm going to go back to something Gary Hart said when it came to integrating business strategy with your talent management strategy. And I, I hearken back to my, my Top Gun days, and my CEO gave all of us a book. He gave three books, really. One of them was The History of the Peloponnesian Wars, which nobody read. <laughs> and, and, the, and, and one of them was The uh, Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. Everybody read that, right? And one thing that um, uh, was, was paramount in that, in that book, and, and, and despite his character flaws, and despite his, his, his corporate social responsibility uh, programs, um, <laughs> he was big on engaging his troops the day or the weeks before that battle. And he would go and he would sit around the fires and he would sit around the camps and he'd sit around the tents with all of his horsemen and he would tell them what's important to him, what's important to execute the next phase of that strategy, that business strategy, and, 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 and you know, raping and pillaging were part of that, you know, that experience, I guess. But it's, it's the fact that he did that. So I would bring that forward with me from that, from that time on. And every time, you know, when I became a squadron CEO and, and, and beyond, I would go and I would visit all the shops on my ship, and I would tell them, hey, tomorrow, this is going to happen, and I want you guys to know. Number one, we're going, to go, we're going to go dark so you won't be getting emails from your families. Uh, number two, this is what it means to be successful, and we are the key players in making that happen. And so by engaging them at that level um, and with that intimacy and making them feel that they're a key part in making that happen, it's a great way to integrate uh, them into the, the, you know, the big picture, as I call it, and also making them feel like they are not only a member, but a, a huge and valuable member of that team. Thanks. I have a follow-up question. Um, why are some organizational cul cultures so resilient and resistant to change despite an urgent need to do so? This for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, those things that I just mentioned as, as um, binding somebody to a company and making them feel as a member are the exact things that are counterproductive to uh, culture change, mainly because this, the, the, the values that they represented on one day may not be the same the next day. And so you have to simultaneously, and, and uh, I can't remember who it was, I think back, I, maybe it was Chuck, uh, but somebody talked about some of those change challenges and the resilience to change. And, 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 and in fact, when it comes down to it, the human uh, talent level is job security. I'm not as important as I was the day before. 
the things that I represented, my value contribution is not as important as it was the day before, and I'm going to fight not being important. Um, and, I, and that's a very general way to look at it, but I think that kind of captures most of the resilience. And sometimes it's just we can't stop doing what we're doing to do what we need to do. I forgot to mention that all the other panelists should feel free to chime in as the rest of you are talking. And actually, I was going to chime in on something Brick said just to follow up. Your military stories reminded me of the night before D-Day. I think Eisenhower walked among the troops um, just to connect with them. So that's what I was reminded of. Um, OK, so Bob, you're up. Um, how can one maintain a strong culture in times of change? Well, first, I'd like to commend Primo for providing the, the nice summary he gave uh, of our discussion and my, my fellow uh, colleagues here who participated in that. I think um, Primo uh, highlighted some very, very important elements of you know, how you manage organizational culture in times of change. But to add to his comments, you know, let's, let's look at um, two of those elements, culture and change. Um, cult cultures a, a really interesting thing to understand. Um, and, you, and you really do need to understand it if you're going to do something with it, all right? So wh what, what are the drivers of your culture? Um, we talked in our group about uh, some cultures being driven by some sort of uh, special sauce, let's call it. Um, e either a technology that the organization possesses or uh, a group of individuals with uh, certain skills. Um, maybe the culture is driven by where that organization is. You know, it's, it's a locational kind of thing. Um, but you need to understand what the cultural drivers are. You need to understand what's good about that, that particular culture and what's not so good about it. Um, we've seen in the past couple of weeks a lot on the news about uh, some of the, 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 the culture of the entertainment industry that are very destructive and they're not good and they are fortunately being changed today. Harassment, uh, sexual harassment in, in the industry, that's part of their culture. That needs to go, and it's going. So um, that's a culture that is changing. But we're really talking about organizations that are in a state of change, and how does that impact their culture? What, what do we need to derive from a culture, change from a culture, or um, propel forward uh, to do better in our business um, through um, you know, working with a culture. Um, what, what is change? Well, change encompasses a, a very large range of, of things. I mean, change could be something as, as big as your company has just been acquired by another company that has a very, very different culture. All right, so you've got to manage that. You've got to make sure that the organizations that are coming together value and respect each other's culture. Uh, we talked in our group about how uh, counterproductive it is often for a big company to acquire another company and say, okay, you have a new, com a new culture, embrace it, love it, or leave it, right? That's not terribly productive. Uh, what you need to do is you need to, again, zero in on the elements of the culture that you're working with and try and leverage the best elements of that culture, grow them, propel them, and then kind of minimize uh, and mitigate the, the less attractive uh, elements of culture. Um, on the other end of the spectrum of change, you have um, what, what I talked about earlier today when I was introducing myself. Um, one of our businesses situated in Santa Rosa, California, is undergoing uh, very different kinds of changes, and um, it's affecting their culture. Um, the business is getting smaller because they're um, less and less because they're trying to manufacture in, in the state of California and the environment's not um, helping them to be as competitive as they need to be. Um, and, and then now you've had this natural disaster. Um, what can we do for these people? Uh, these are some of the things that we looked at. I, again, I think we need to um, kind of tailor our approach to dealing with cultures in times of change. but. Um, one of the ways we talked about doing that was the iceberg model that uh, Vlad shared with us. You know, look below the, the surface of the water. Look at that two-thirds of that iceberg that, and, and try and figure out how you get at those behaviors, those attributes, and expose them honestly, openly, 
transparently so that you can address them. You can either get rid of them or you can build them up to make a more successful organization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you alluded to this. How, do you have any recommendations as to what you can do to maintain culture during a time of crisis? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, w w in, my, in my last position with L3, uh, we had um, companies, as I mentioned, uh, all over the world. And what we would typically do is uh, the leadership team that I was a part of, we would make the rounds of all of those companies on an ongoing basis. Uh, every, every year at the beginning of the year, we would go to all of these businesses and share with them the uh, results of the business from the prior year. And then we would you know, set the strategy. That was my responsibility, was to be the, uh, to set the strategy for the group and to you know, make sure everybody understood what it was and that they were signed up to it. And then while we were there, we typically spent time together um, in an open forum you know, with sometimes hundreds of people, sometimes smaller groups, you know, talking very specifically about what was important to them and you know, what motivated their employees. And, and the range of things were, it was, it was really a broad range. You know, in some cases it was, our business is so tied to this university next door, you know, we get half of our employees from there, you know, we, 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 we need to do more with that university. So that particular business was in the um, cyber business and uh, what we would do is we would, uh, we would sponsor a hackathon we would invite you know, a dozen of their best and brightest you know, engineers to come in and compete in a hackathon. And then we would hire those people, the, the winners typically, or they would get a job offer, right? <laughs> but, but that culture of that business was so tied to that university that we had to do something to kind of build that. Thank you. We're going, please. We are going through renovation next year, and we're trying to maintain our culture in times of you know, extreme stress. You can't give a relaxing massage when there's construction outside the window. And so a lot of people are worried about their, about their hours. And will the company take care of me? Like, it's going to be a great shiny toy that we all play with a year from now. But what about the next year? I've got to put food on the table. And uh, I, somebody, I think, Vlad, you said something about artifacts and totems and you know, putting your culture on the walls if you can. Um, we, we were playing with the idea of there's a long hallway going down to our training room. And we wanted to, the learning manager, um, he said, I want to open up the mind of these people as they walk through this hall to get them in the, in the mood for you know, new ideas. And let's put some quotes along the wall throughout time, like a timeline, you know, starting with Plato and you know, going through Aristotle, Copernicus, all, the, you know, all these great thought leaders that are you know, opening up their mind. And then we scrapped that idea because we thought, wait a minute, why aren't we putting our culture on the walls? Why aren't we putting the quotes? Now, I learned that I have a young company. We're only 56 years old, so I learned that today <laughs> from this morning. But, um, but we have enough, you know, who we are, how we behave, how we succeed. Take the company handbook and pla plaster it on the walls because it's, re it's in the minds of the people, and you can also point to it right there in English and Spanish. This is, you know, this is our culture. Let's stay true to that. And nobody wants to be... Uh, a hypocrite you know the general manager the HR director does not want to be you know hey we care about the golden rule and then when you leave the room yeah right you know so so let's have executives and, and leaders in the organization that are accountable to those words on the walls and that's one way we're doing it great idea and you have uh, so we'll open it up now for questions so um, thank you I, I'm interested in um, the the engagement scores um, that we typically see, and we understand that, you know, only about 14% of our workforce says that they're actively engaged in their work. Um, and I'm going to tie that into the cultural conversation. And it seems to me that to the degree that an organization can anticipate and be sort of proactive to change you know within their organization and with, within culture generally seems to be those that rise to become the top 100 you know places to to um, work so I I'd like to hear from the panel you know what what your views are about 
you know, A, engagement scores generally and, and why we have such a poor um, track record of engaging our employees and, and, and to what extent do you in your organizations look beyond the immediate reaction and, and anticipate change in the future? I have a, I guess an illustration. Um, I, I once worked for a large aerospace uh, defense company um, and, and, and Bob and I sh sh share some very uh, similar experiences. Uh, lots of employees, uh, global, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they uh, started in the Gallup uh, engagement surveys, and then they started debriefing these, and then they expected for uh, various levels of uh, organization to put to action plans together. And as I started getting debriefs at the executive level on uh, the, the, the sector level executives, their scores were amazing. They had the highest engagement scores. At the division executive level, their scores were amazing. At the program management level, their scores were amazing. And then it started to get really bad. And I looked at some of the things that were identified in every one of the, the, kind of the problem uh, entities. And, um, and they, it all came down to leadership. I mean, just a gross absence in leadership. And, and, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons I, I started working with a former director of personnel at Apple and some other folks is, is uh, to develop leadership programs for the frontline leaders because that's where you get your engagement. And if you're not engaging at the earliest and lowest level, you're going to have engagement problems for the rest of that employment uh, history in those employee base. So that's, that, that, that's how I look at it in engagement surveys, and I see it as a, mainly as an absence of leadership at the frontline leader level. Can, can I just say that I totally agree. Leadership is everything. We had our engagement survey just uh, this month. One department went from a, it was a 24 point increase. And, and I'll never, I, I noted one question, I'm paid fairly is one of the questions we ask. <laughs> And it was a 41% success rate, you know, so I can't do the math, but 59% uh, said, no, I'm not paid fairly. It went up to 87%, from 41 to 87. We did not increase wages that much to have that big of an impact. But what we did was we had changed the leader because all of the scores were low. So even in a question like, I'm paid fairly, you get a better, you get a better response because you feel appreciated and you got a boss who cares about you and leadership is working. So I've had responsibility for um, employee surveys in my career. And I think it's important to step back and ask, engagement scores for what purpose? What are you going to do with the information? And the question that has always surfaced in any organization was, what's my safety in participating? Do I really know if I'm not being tracked? Uh, do I have an opportunity to write in comments? So how do we get over those basic challenges? And then if I do tell you, if I do share, then how are you addressing the feedback that I provide? Uh, and so let's be upfront. If I'm sharing and providing feedback, how do I get that information? What are those next steps? And if there's negative information that surfaces, how will that be addressed? What's the investment by the management team if there's something that's not positive, that's not a smiley face, that they're willing to tackle? So at Molson Coors, we had um, an opportunity for people to write open comments. And the issue of trust, trusting management surfaced. And I have to give them credit. They didn't back away from it. They wanted to do a deep dive. And they surfaced that they did the deep dive. And I think that's, those are some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. If you want participation, what are the concerns that people may have, and how do you address them? I, I agree. I, I think, um, as all of us have said on the panel here, it all tracks back to leadership and, and management. And if you don't have an environment that's open and transparent and uh, one you can trust, then you're 
you know, you run the risk of, of having results, as Doreen uh, just described, happen in, in your organization. I, and I shared a very similar story with my group, and I saw some of the eyes, you know, raised, you know, when I said it. But it's really true in large organizations, particularly large organizations, and, and ones that are kind of more rigid and hierarchical, like the ones, you know, Rick and I have worked in, you know, large aerospace companies. Um, you, you really do have to work extra hard to convince the employees that this is an organization you can trust, it's a leadership team you can trust, and that you know, your honesty and your openness is what's gonna help us make this a better organization. Not your honesty and your openness is gonna get you in trouble. And I've seen honesty and openness get people in trouble. You know, I've seen organizations that have said to people, hey, this is your annual employee survey. Um, you know, all of the result. I mean, all of the inputs are confidential. You don't have to worry about a thing. And then being on the leadership team, when the results were briefed to me, I had the, you know, I, I, I heard the briefer say to me, <clears throat> we're, we're not doing so well in this category right here. Uh, if you want to know who's providing those inputs, uh, we can get you there. And I went through the roof. I mean, that's just, you know, that that's not how you build a, an environment or an atmosphere of trust. Anyway, back to the leadership. I mean, it all, you know, the, it, it all starts at the top. Uh, there's an organization I'm familiar with and work for where uh, they track results over years. And they understood that if there were no positive changes, the responsibility stopped at the management level and made changes there. So the question is, uh, how serious are companies taking these uh, scores, the intent, and what are they willing to do about making changes? And I wonder, too, if I may, um, you know, the second part of my, um, my query was what are we doing about anticipating change? Because, you know, we're in the middle of, of a lot of change, you know, sort of in, in a socioeconomic, you know, and, and sort of cultural uh, context and you know we have a very different generation and different mindset coming up into organizations and uh, I still see you know where we organizations are running with the mindset of the sort of the boomer right and and it's so it's such an anathema to the upcoming generation so I, I, I wonder you know when, when we're kind of gonna pivot our thinking to try and stop trying to fight that and, and embrace you know, the changes and, and how we do that. I think you just said it. Change the questions. I, I'm convinced that we're going to get better inputs from millennials than we did from my generation. You know, as, as we discussed uh, in, in our discussion, you know, when I was coming up, people just, they would do anything to keep their job. The millennials think differently about the workplace, and they're going to change the workplace to make it an environment where they want to spend time or they're going to leave. I think that's good. I think that's what it's going to take. I, I, it's going to take a generational change. It's going to take boomers changing their mindsets. It's going to take millennials stepping forward, taking risks, which they seem to be very happy to do. And if they can't make positive changes, they'll move on. And I'll, I'll finish up with, from my experience, and, and, and examining all generations of uh, talent um, and working directly with, uh, uh, for many years, average age of 18. Um, uh, in my opinion, and in my strong opinion, I guess, um, that great leadership is agnostic when it comes to generations. Yes, question back there. How do you cultivate a high engagement and caring environment or culture when you are regulated at every level? You know, that's something I encounter with clients all the time. Is yeah, we do that, but you don't understand. There's HIPAA, there's this, there's, you know. Well, pharmaceutical and aerospace is regulated. Well, I, I was say, yeah. Pharmaceutical is, is one of the 
the highest regulated industries there, there is, and, and rightly so. Um, but it's understood by the people who work in that industry, at least by the larger companies that, that I had the pleasure of working for. I'm not going to own everybody. And so, uh, again, an example of the importance of education, the compliance requirements that are required by a number of different outside agencies um, there are certain populations where it's more critical for them to know the intimate details. But I sit in HR. I don't need to know those intimate details, but I need to understand them. And so I need to have an overview that this is what my colleagues are being challenged with as their detailing physicians. This is what the R&D chemists are challenged with as they're running chemical trials, dr drug trials. So it's it's education so that people understand responsibility at all levels by all employees, why we're doing this, and why there's a reason and benefit to it. Uh, if, if I may just piggyback a little bit. Um, and I, I think I've worked in what I would call highly regulated, um, especially when it comes to foreign military sales um, uh, and in other other consulting to other businesses and basically you have a box uh, governing instruction regulation inspection um, oversight uh, all those things drive you to a box and um, the companies that thrive in those environments and, the, and they all you know the you know the ones that you know about all do is because they approach their operations with a risk management process that allows them to be on the cutting edge of innovation uh, creativity um, and, 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 and shifting uh, in terms of, of new environments and new challenges, but they also recognize the boundaries of those, those, those boxes. And so uh, um, it, it gets back to how do you build, uh, know your box, and then develop your uh, operational risk management processes so that you can get right to the edge without going over. I interviewed at an insurance company one time. It was not a health insurance company. Um, and they told me their culture right up front. And I was interviewing for an in-house legal position, and they said, it's highly regulated in the insurance industry. They said, we view the Department of Insurance as the enemy, and we've told all our supervisors they can ignore legal counsel's advice at will. So I said, well, this is not really my culture. <laughs> <laughs> just, didn't want to, just didn't want to battle that every day. Yes. I have a question here. Um, I know that we're all throwing out ideas of how to share culture and how important it is. Um, but at the end of the day, when we're talking um, with our partners, our investors, what methods have you used or ideas that you can use that not don't put the cost on culture, but the investment, the value of it, um, so that when they start viewing the numbers just increasing by putting signs or the various methods that we've created that will show. I hope I'm being clear. Does that make sense? One way we've kept uh, development costs low, but um, still kept it going um, and, and increased our culture is take the, uh, the executive committee and use them as your leaders, your, sorry, your teachers of courses for your staff, um, institutional knowledge. So. Um, one of the most popular ones we did this year was our hotel manager who's number two in the organization right underneath the general manager of the hotel he did a course on managing up how to how to please your boss now everybody in the room was his employee right and he was talking about he was, and and it was just the, it was so well received our director of marketing does a class on communication um, I, I do, you know, just in, in their informal chats. It's not like I have to go learn the leader's guide and then pass out the participant manual and get the PowerPoint ready. It's more of a fireside chat style, but it costs zero, right? And they're eating it up. And it doesn't matter if you're millennial, baby boomer, or whatever, you're getting developed. There's a reason to stay on this train as it goes down the track. And in the next nine months, you're going to be. Uh, renovation and really hard but we're still going to stay close to each other and that's one of the ways we can do it you can't put a bunch of training in the budget in a renovation year right for our, our owners would not you know accept that so that's one of the ways we've gotten around that uh, 
I, I really am very suspicious when I see gimmicky uh, slogans and um, other um, plans of action that um, are, are, are superficial um, and getting back to what really drives people to invest their energy, their effort, their focus, their intellect, their faith, faith their trust, is to be inspired to, to take all those things and exert a magnitude and a vector in the same direction that you want them to go. And only, that only starts by inspiring them um, with the, the, the why part of it. And you've probably seen those, those uh, TED Talks. Um, when they get the why and they, and, and they do it in such a fashion they can commit all of those things that they could control and can, can cr contribute, great things happen. And when you get the entire team doing it, wonderful and extraordinary things happen. When I worked for Accenture, there was never a presentation that was made without drilling down to the lowest level of what the benefits would be for any initiative. I don't think we do enough of that. The other gap is when we implement something, we tend not to show the impact, the ROI. It's a challenge, but it can always be done. I'm always asking for money. <laughs> But so, so if, if I, have to, I have to be in their face, I have to show them this is why it's beneficial. And, 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 and when they take the risk to step out and say, okay, Dory, here's, here's some dollars, you can go do it. Um, how do I show the return? And if you have that, you have to have that mindset and planning prior to the implementation. So if I'm going to implement this, whatever the strategy may be, how am I going to measure impact? because that's going to influence your design of the process. And once you begin to operate and think that way, and you know how you're going to measure the impact, it's a challenge, but it can be done. You can bring in consultants that specialize in that. Um, then when you walk into and you sell, thank you very much, this is what we achieved, give me more money for something else. Yeah, my. Uh last position with L3, we, we experienced tremendous growth in the business in 2016. I m made a commitment to the corporate offices to grow the business by uh, 4%. Um, by year end, we had grown the business by 34%. Um, now we're very, very good at growing the business organically, but we're really good at M&A. And that's really how L3 has grown uh, throughout its history, through acquisition. And um, the, one of the first things we look at when we identify a prospective uh, acquisition target is the culture. And, and we look at whether or not it's going to fit into the larger family of companies. Um, and we look at what the likely impact of an acquisition is going to be to that culture. And is that good or is it bad? We look at what we can bring after the acquisition that's going to enhance the culture or enhance the business in some way. And very, very early on in the process, we identify a leader to make sure that they keep that business intact, align with our strategy, but preserve the culture. Our, our, our objective, I can't think of one example of our acquiring a company with the goal of changing the culture. The goal is always just to make the culture better. Well, making making it better in the sense that if if there are bad things about the culture, you know, we talked about the entertainment industry. There's some bad things that are being called out of the culture right now. Those are the kinds of things we want to eliminate from the culture. But if there are good things about the culture that make people feel better about themselves, better about their positions, uh, more committed to the company, more focused on, you know, the objectives of the business. Those are good things that we want to engender and grow and what have you. Last question, perhaps. So I've been fascinated um, by, by the conversation. But I think, Brick, you've kind of um, captured my attention. Um, because your leadership language um, connects with connects with mine, and because when we look when we look at culture, I don't care how big your organization is or how small it is, 
Um, I, I certainly sign on, sign, sign on to the notion that leadership is everything at all levels. And we've talked about you know, growth. We've talked about attracting top talent. We talked about how leadership makes an impact on each level of the organization. What's the cost of not doing it? What's the cost of not attracting top talent? What's the cost of not creating a culture of leadership? Um, not just at the director level, C-suite level, but really creating a culture of leadership throughout the entire organization. And so I can see the cost of doing it, the rate of return. What's the cost of not doing it for organizations? Can I, is it okay if I tell a story? Um, I like stories. Jim likes stories too, though. <laughs> um, when I transitioned from a 27-year uh, military career into a large corporate organization, I recognized something that I always took for granted. And, and it, and it kind of goes like this. Um, in a, a squadron, a Navy squadron, a fighter squadron, it's got about 250 people, and every year you lose 30% of your force through normal rotations. So every, think about it, in your companies, every year if you lose, lost 30% of your force across the entire spectrum of talent, how would you compensate for that? What impact would that make to you? So um, when you look at what allows a squadron or any other military unit to survive, produce, and high risk, um, uh, completely um, low uh, information environments, um, what is it that can drive them to produce? And you've seen, you know, in all these operations over the, you know, since the Gulf War, how successful they've been at doing that. It's this um, this approach where everybody is or training and teaching uh, their replacement to become them, and you have this constant recycling of. Uh, as a squadron CEO, I start almost all my conversations with. Hey, future CEO, how would you handle this situation? And so it just, it's, just, it's a switch in context where you're, you're always trying to replace yourself. And when you do that, you know, the big fear with most employees is that, oh, I could, I could train somebody to replace me and I'd be out of a job. But the reality is you've just created an opportunity for growth in a company because now instead of one of you, there's two or three or more because the legacy will continue well beyond your, your existence in that company. And so that's how uh, they manage this, this threat to continuity and growth and performance. And this is very complex. They, they start developing leaders at the very youngest level, and they always, the mantra is, you're always training your replacement. And I think that, I think that answers that question. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me ask a last question. <laughs> Short question, short answer, or short answers, please. Um, and then I'll take over again. I'll tell you what's next. Uh, you know, I, there was a question about uh, resistance to cultural change and uh, why people are so resistant. You know, it made me think of one research recently. I read that people not as Resi uh, sorry, not as resistant to technological changes in their organizations. They're not as resistant to structural changes as they are resistant to cultural changes. So how do you, based on your experience, uh, break that resistance? Break the resistance and make sure that people adopt, buy in, embrace this change? The mindset that I have when I implement any strategy is I understand that I'm evoking change, whether it's cultural change or any type of change. And when I'm specifically managing major change strategies, I also understand not to fall into the pit, pitfall of focusing on the resistance. It's recognizing that resistance will be there but what we tend to do is to focus more on how do we get everybody on board as opposed to acknowledging, understanding where the support is and going with that energy, the positive energy around the change and building that momentum and creating more momentum around that and building that grassroots 
level at all levels. Um, and there's never, uh, it's understanding, and we say this, but we don't necessarily do it, that where there is a major change initiative, over communicate because you're managing the rumor mill. If you have nothing to say, you repeat what you said last week, but you're constantly saying something. So that's my approach. I guess I'll add one point, I guess. I, I liken change to like a balloon, right? Um, and if you push on one side of it, it, it the, the other side you know, extends. Um, but the, the content of that sphere or that balloon still is intact. It requires pressure from all quadrants pushing at the same time in order to squeeze the bad, the bad cultural elements out of, and, and then, and, and to be able to replace it with something else. So, uh, you know, so it, 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 it's a full core press. You have muscle memory, you have legacy patterns of behavior, you have all sorts of, of resilience that are just inherent in, in, in the DNA of a, of a company or an organization that have to be squeezed out and then allowed to fill up with something new and different. And it, it requires, and it could be years. It, it's typically not moments. So that pressure has to be exerted the entire time until you can plant that flag and change mountain. Uh, there's a soccer team called Barcelona Football Club. And they had a coach, and as they were trying to change their culture um, a decade ago, they had a coach, an assistant coach just watch the bench when a goal was scored. And you had two different types of players. You had the people who were just sitting on their hands watching the game and didn't celebrate because they weren't picked that day by the coach and they were bitter. And then you had the team players who just celebrated like they scored it and jumped up and hugged and high-fived. Um, they're, they're both in your organizations and you want to keep the good ones and you want to um, introduce the bad ones to uh, new employment opportunities outside. <laughs> <laughs> Let me facilitate your new job. Um, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's important in uh, maintaining, changing, and going through times of change. You want to build on the strengths um, and keep those people around. So you, you've heard um, the two greatest lies. The first being, hi, I'm Bob Bushnell. I'm from corporate or group in my case, and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one was, welcome, Bob. We're really glad you're here. <laughs> but so I would go around as I said to our different businesses and um, we we talk about you know business performance and the objectives for the coming year and um, we, we'd also talk about culture and 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 I'd often ask them what they don't like about their culture and boy they'd open up the, the floodgates man they'd tell me all kinds of things about their culture that they didn't like so rather than tell them, hey, I'm here to change your culture. I would tell them, I'm here to you know, keep your culture and work with you. And you know, I'm gonna be, we're going to be bringing some changes to your organization. But hopefully, they're not going to be negatively impacting your culture. They're going to be positive kind of evolutions to your culture. And explain to them what these different things are that we're going to bring. And hopefully, some of them would address what they've described as bad things about their culture, and they will also understand why it's going to be good for their business. Um, hopefully, in terms of improving their culture, certainly in terms of improving their business performance. So, you know, just characterize it all in positive terms as opposed to negative terms. Make them comfortable that you know you're good with who they are, and together we're just going to get better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. Round of applause. On this happy note, uh, our event is adjourned. However, don't get up. Yet. <laughs> well, first of all, I think it was a success. Uh, I hope you've learned something new, met new people, uh, were able to communicate and network, and there's more time for you know, communication and networking during lunch which uh, is almost served. That's number one. Number two, uh, in your packets, or actually you know, on your table, you will see a few pieces of paper. 
uh, among them is the 2016-2017 snapshot for the School of Management. You can keep it as a reference, of course. But more importantly, there is a survey, Executive Talent Management Survey. Uh, and this is a prerequisite to get lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you fill it, fill it out, give it either to me or to uh, uh, Gagandeep. She's over there by, by the wall. Or uh, Jordan. Jordan, you're leaving, but, or, or to Jordan, uh, or to me. Did I say to me? Yes. So. Uh, and um, of course, enjoy lunch and enjoy uh, networking. Then you have pens. Don't forget to take the tip, by the way. Uh, they're yours to keep. You see the mugs, School of Management, they're yours to keep as well. Don't take tablecloth. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Susan Wood, I don't know where she is, uh, our marketing coordinator, who has basically been um, instrumental in organizing this event, Gagan Kaur and uh, Jordan Light. <laughs> Round of applause for them, please. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, of course, one more time. And we have presents for all of you and for our wonderful uh, moderator, Marilyn, as well. And, and uh, just one more thought. Um, the idea behind this forum, uh, be behind this series of events, this is the second installment, is to build a community. Build a community around the topic of talent management in different areas of talent management. Again, last time we talked about millennials, this time we talked about organizational culture, next time we'll talk about something else, and this is one of the questions in your survey, what would you like to hear about next? And I'm, I'm, I, it's my hope that we are right now in the very beginning, so building that community, and it's really nice to see people coming back this time around, and some new faces. So I think this is yet another step towards that goal. I would like to thank you very much again for coming, for joining us, and I hope to see you, if not before, then next year for sure. Thank you.